Good morning, everybody. Welcome to the beginning of our 2022 January residency. Um, so excited. I'm going to do a land acknowledgement before uh, I hand it over to Sarah and Poupe, who are um, bravely leading us off this morning. Um, we acknowledge that the land where we are located here in Portland um, rests on the traditional village sites of the Multnomah, Kathlamet, Clackamas, Tualatin, Kalapulia, Malala, bands of the Chinook, and many other tribes who made their homes along the Columbia River. We also acknowledge the systemic policies of genocide, dislocation, relocation, and assimilation that still impact many indigenous first families, native families today. As settlers and guests on these lands, we respect the work of native nations and first peoples, leaders and families, and make ongoing efforts to center indigenous knowledge, creativity, resilience, and resistance. We acknowledge that this acknowledgement is not enough and is one of many steps leading towards the more active essential task of the rematriation of the native lands. I'm going to read um, the preface to Braiding Sweet Grass by Robin Wall Kimmerer. Robin Wall Kimmerer is a member of the Potawatomi Nation, um, a tribe who inhabited um, steward lands around the Great Lakes. Um, hold out your hands and let me lay upon them a sheaf of freshly picked sweet grass, loose and flowing like newly washed hair. Golden green and glossy above, the stems are banded with purple and white where they meet the ground. Hold the bundle up to your nose. Find the fragrance of honeyed vanilla over the scent of river water and black earth. And you understand its scientific name, Hirok Hiroklo odorata meaning the fragrant, holy grass. In our language, it is called wingash, the sweet smelling hair of mother earth. Breathe it in and you start to remember things you didn't know you'd forgotten. A sheaf of sweet grass bound at the end and divided into thirds is ready to braid. In braiding sweet grass so that it is smooth, glossy, and worthy of the gift, a certain amount of tension is needed. As any little girl with tight braids will tell you, you have to pull a bit. Of course, you can do it yourself by tying one end to a chair or by holding it in your teeth and braiding backward away from yourself. But the sweetest way is to have someone else hold the end so that you pull gently against each other, all the while leaning in, head to head, chatting and laughing, watching each other's hands, one holding steady while the other shifts the slim bundles over one another, each in its turn. Linked by sweet crass, there is Reciprocity between you, linked by sweet grass, the holder as vital as the braider. The braid becomes finer and thinner as you near the end until you're braiding individual blades of grass and then you tie it off. There is reciprocity between you. I wish for us, and now I'm thinking about bell hooks, rest in peace the patron saint of teaching among so many things. I'm thinking about reciprocity and commitment. 
And I wish for that, wish for all of us to be in a community of collaboration and reciprocity where we are committed to language and committed to connection. With that said, I'm gonna um, ask Justin very quickly to come up. Let's give a little snap clap for Justin Duyo. <clears throat> He's going to give everybody a quick sense of um, some logistics for Zoom. There's Justin, look <laughs> at him. Hey everybody, good morning um, and welcome back. I just wanna say two quick things before we get started. Um, first, to make sure that your videos, your video is on and your, um, audio is muted just to make sure that we all, you know, Zoom isn't ideal, but um, we're here together as a community. We want to feel that way. So um, if you're able to turn on your video and then number two, uh, know that throughout the whole residency, um, I'm going to kind of live in the chat and make sure that if you make any comments or questions um, that I, I can relay that to the teacher and, and, or the speaker in case they don't see it, um, but also that there will likely be designated times throughout um, or questions and comments that you can voice vocally. Um, so yeah, just know that um, if you say something in the chat, I will see it and make sure that it's so. Great, thanks, Justin. Um, um, finally, finally oh. I'm trying to mute here, sorry. Um, and then finally, before I hand it over to Sarah and Poupe, just a heads up, we'll have this conversation and then we actually will be jumping on a different link, a different Zoom link from 10.30 to 11.30. So just sort of throwing that out there. Um, with that said, I welcome, let's give a snap clap for Sarah and Poupe, a minor detail. Good morning, everyone. Hi everyone, good to see you all. Um, and thanks for being here with us for this very first session of the residency. Um, just uh, to make sure um, if everyone could have at the ready the either um, a copy of the novel or a copy of the excerpts we sent out, I'll just putting those back in the chat um, in case anyone doesn't isn't able to locate them. Um, it's like a weirdly huge file because I don't really know how to scan things from my phone properly. So um, it'll be up there in a minute. Um, but while that's loading, um, we just wanted to begin with a, with a visual. Um, so much of this novel is about um, borders and barriers and the limitations or lack of limitations in which different bodies can move through space, and specifically um, the space of Israel and Palestine. And um, so, oh, can, um, uh, screen sharing seems to be disabled, Jay, can you do something? Thank you. Yeah, um, now try it. Okay. Yeah, it's working. Let me just get pulled up the right thing. All right, does this come up for people? Yeah, okay. Um, so, um, this particular series of maps um, is on the website of Jewish Voice for Peace, an organization um, working uh, towards Palestinian self-determination. Um, and just to give a sense um, of the very real and concrete ways in which um, the land designated as Palestine has shrunk um, over the last century or so. Um, 
you know, we see in 1918, um, a small number of Jewish settlements designated in black, um, or specifically um, Zionist Jewish settlements designated in black. Um, and then we see how over the years, um, the land afforded um, to Palestine and Palestinians become increasingly small so that we really only have the West Bank and Gaza um, as part of Palestine today. And we see the incursion of um, Israeli settlements into these blue areas as well. Um, uh, and uh, as we'll speak about soon, um, the, um, the first part of the novel um, takes place in 1949. So when the map looks something like this, um, specifically it, it takes place in the Negev or Nakab desert in the southern part um, of Israel or Palestine at the time. Um, and um, the second half of the novel takes place um, in the modern day. So when the map looked a lot more like this. Um, Pupe, do you have anything you wanna add to that? Um, I, I will say more just when I talk about the second half of the book and just give a summary, yeah. Cool. Um, and then um, before we really um, get into the specifics of discussing um, the novel, uh, we just wanted to put the author's voice in the room. Um, Arnia Shibley um, is, um, a uh, both a novelist and a scholar of um, media and cultural studies um, who currently um, lives between Berlin and Jerusalem. Um, she's the author of several novels as well as nonfiction works and um, one volume of essays in conversation with Edward Said. Um, and um, she is fluent, I believe in, in seven or so languages. Um, but when she reads from her work, she always reads it in Arabic. Um, so um, this is a, a brief excerpt of um, Shibley reading uh, from minor detail. Sarah, we can't hear her. Oh, there's no audio? Mm -hmm. hmm. If you have oh, your I... headphones in, Sarah, that might be, the audio might be going to your headphones and not the... Uh, got it. Okay, I'm gonna take them out. Okay. See if that works. <laughs> Is that working now? I'm putting the headphones away, seeing if that works. Put them away. Okay. Maybe just turn it up a bit. So. Yeah, وأعواد القصر التي راح جنود يجبون بينها وبينما قام هؤلاء بتمشيط المكان بحثا عن أسلحة ما انصرف هو يتأمل روز الماشي في تلك البقعة الخضراء المحاطة بكتبان رمل جرداء لا نهائيا ثم أخذ يطوف بين الجمال المرمية فوق الأرض أشبه بتلال صغيرة كساه العشب اليابس كان عددها ستة وعلى الرغم من أن جميعها كانت ميتة وراحت الرمال تمتص دماءها إلى جابها الفؤدة صدرت حركات طفيفة من أطراف بعض وقد استقر بصره هو على ضمة عشب يابس استلقت قرب فم أحدها وتم اقتلاعها من جذورها التي ما زالت حبيبات الرمل عالقة بها Hi, my name is Lucy Jaquette and I'm the translator from Arabic to English of Minor Detail this short reading is from part one. The dogs howling finally stopped and a degree of calm settled over the place. 
Now, the only sound was the muffled weeping of a girl who had curled up inside her black clothes like a beetle, and the rustle of thorn acacia, turban leaves, and cane grass, as the soldiers moved through the spot of green surrounded by endless barren sand dunes, combing the area for weapons while he stood there and inspected some manure. Then he walked around the camels lying on the ground, which resembled small hills covered in dry grass. There were six of them. And although they were dead, and the sand was languidly sucking their blood into its depths, a few of their limbs still gave off slight movements. His gaze rested on the clutch of dry grass lying by the mouth of one camel. It had been ripped up by the roots, which still held suspended grains of sand. Thank you. Um, with the authors and translators' voices now in the room. Um, okay. Sorry, should I just go ahead? Yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. I, I didn't hear the last part of you. <laughs> um, so we're, I'm just gonna, you have um, four different excerpts from the book. Um, two of them are from the first half of the novel and then two from the second half of the novel. Um, and in each of those sections, we get um, one narrator um, or like one voice is the main voice of the story, um, very different. Uh, one, as uh, Sarah mentioned, happens in 1949. Um, and we um, visit this um, army unit um, and um, we just like observe the daily routine of the officer um, and the soldiers on the camp. Um, and they are there to kind of like move around, make sure that there are no weapons around. Um, and toward the end of that section, um, they go out for a tour and they, um, the section that um, the author and the translator read from, um, they come, um, they arrive at this um, kind of like patch of green grass um, in the desert and they um, see a group of Bedouins. Um, they kill everyone, including the camels, and they bring back a girl from the Bedouin um, people um, who they um, find there. Um, and throughout the narrative, there's like this um, tension or the conflict that the officer seems to tell the soldiers that we should not touch her, we should give her back to the, um, take her back to like the center of the army officers, um, hand her in. Um, but then we learn that they actually gang rape her and kill her and bury her in the desert. Um, in the second half of the book, uh, we move to the present time, even though we are not given a specific date, um, but it's um, present day. Um, and we have a different narrator, a woman, um, a Palestinian woman who um, just reads about this crime in the newspaper um, and gets interested in it, not because of the horrifying um, details of the event or the fact that this rape and murder happened, but really she tells us that what brought her or made her obsessed with this event was the fact that she is born 25 years after um, the girl was killed. Um, and then with this obsession, she goes on this journey to find out where the girl is buried and if she can find out more information. But just like getting on the journey itself is <clears throat> a lot of complication because as a Palestinian, she's not allowed to move around as easily. So she has to borrow an identity car. She has to have someone else rent her a car. And all throughout the second half, we are just like following her on this drive um, toward the location where 
um, nothing really happens, but there's like this constant like fear and intimidation um, of her like feeling that she's like um, an intruder, right? Even though she's not the actual intruder. Um, and she arrives at what is supposedly like, um, the site of the uh, murder and the rape, but then she realizes that's not where it happened. It happened somewhere else. Um, and I don't want to give up the ending, um, but um, she finally is able to just like arrive at this location where she thinks um, the murder and the rape happened. Um, but really we don't get the narrator um, who is on this quest, she doesn't get much information. And at some point she also feels like this whole journey was useless and she could have just stayed home, but we really know it, it's not really useless because the whole experience is bringing us and bringing her into a different um, intimacy and closeness with the murder, even though information is not found really. And I'm gonna leave it at that, not revealing the ending of the book. Um, so we thought we would just speak a little bit, um, each of us would just speak a little bit about our initial experiences with the book, our impressions, um, maybe what drew us to it or what stood out to us. Um, do you wanna go first with that, Pupe, and then I, I can follow up? Yeah, sure. Um, it's strange when Sarah um, suggested that we talk about the book, I had just listened to um, Shibley talk about the novel with David Neiman on Between the Lines podcast. Um, and a lot of the topics that she was talking about, um, I was familiar with, like she's talking about like historical horrors, about um, the role of the archive, about language justice. Um, I do read and... Um, research a lot of, about like the conflict between Israel and Palestine, or I would say the war actually. Um, and so I was like, okay, all of this is very interesting, but why has this novel made so much, like has gotten so much attention? Um, and when Sarah said like, shall we talk about this? I was like, yes, let's talk about it. And when I started reading, I was like, oh, the conversation definitely doesn't do justice to what the novel is doing. Um, what was so amazing for me was as someone who does a lot of work around um, state horror about violence against citizens around the world, um, I was just blown away by the fact that she doesn't really go to the center of the crimes, but the ghost of these crimes is so present in both sections of the book. Um, so that idea of like how to move around something, but actually make it the core of the book was very interesting to me. And of course there are other themes in the book that I was drawn to, which was like just the map, the fact that there are so many different maps of this area and the fact that even the names of the towns have different um, versions in like Arabic and English and uh, Hebrew, um, it's just like, mind blowing to think about like, what does this mean for someone who actually lives on the land and has to navigate all these different conflicts on a day-to-day -day basis? Um, so that was what I was drawn to, um, but basically just like this idea of um, how to actually keep the horror, the violence, the murder, um, the injustice, um, not in the words of the text, but actually in the language or in the space around the words um, and keep the story so haunted um, with only like everyday details and like the routine of two different, completely two different lives. Yeah, I was so, um, I was so pleased um, when Pupe wanted to, to discuss this novel um, because I read it. Um, I think in at the end of the summer and um, just been constantly thinking about it since. Um, I came to this novel, um, similarly, I, I had sort of heard people talking about it, how incredible it was and um, having been um, also involved in um, activism and organizing around uh, Palestinian self-determination, um, particularly um, from my perspective as a Jewish person 
um, I um, I'm really, you know, looking for for um, Palestinian authors and, and voices to read. Um, and, you know, specifically, I'm just sort of, this is just sort of occurring to me now, but um, for myself, one of the reasons um, why the Palestinian struggle has become um, really important to me is thinking about my own experience growing up, going to, you know, Hebrew school classes in New Jersey and being taught a really different history um, than the history that's in this book, right? Um, so being given these official maps that this that this protagonist must contend with um, and having um, understood only, you know, as I became an adult that that these maps, how much, how much violence and displacement and horror these maps were covering up. Um, uh, and and um, this is just such a um, such a potent and powerful um, exploration of the of the violence that those borders and those nut covering up does. Um, I had the so it's a, it's a short novel, right? It's um, it's one hundred and five pages long. Um, it took Shibley twelve years to write it, um, which is fascinating to me as someone who also writes short, <laughs> um, who puts a lot of attention on the sentence, on the, on the individual word. Um, and um, it, I think that this book really shows how even in only a hundred pages and maybe perhaps because it, the narrative is so compressed, um, so much can be put into, into relatively few pages. Um, we don't need um, a sort of a, a maximalist approach to tell an entire history, an entire story. Um, and um, I also um, am just uh, so blown away by the um, really like the creative boldness of having two halves of a book that are so disparate from each other stylistically in terms of the characters, in terms of the setting and the place. Um, but, um, but that, are in conversation with each other so deeply, um, as we'll probably talk about later, there are certain sort of um, sensory elements that repeat from one section to the other. Um, but you know, as someone who, um, I think a lot of times, um, a lot of times when I read a novel that takes on multiple narrators, um, it, I find it unsatisfying. Um, I find it, uh, uh, I get the feeling at, at that, um, of the author sort of like running out of story to tell, so bringing in someone else to, to continue it. Um, but when you really feel that the two are essential to each other and when that essentialness happens from such disparate perspectives, um, I just think it's incredibly exciting and really um, makes me excited for the possibilities of what a novel can do. Mm -hmm. Sarah, um, what you mentioned about like the importance of reading uh, works by Palestinians as a Jewish person um, that made me think about um, how we can't really come into the literature of the region without our own um, political baggages that we have, right? So as someone who, as an Iranian who grew up in Iran, the Palestinian um, struggle and fight is a completely different narrative that is presented by the Iranian government, right? So now in the civil activism in Iran, people actually like shout out slogans like, we don't care about Gaza, we don't care about Palestine, we care about our own rights because there's so much attention to the Palestinian fight that people think like the resources needs to come back to the country rather than to the Palestinian fight. So it's completely politicized, right? They're not really caring about the Palestinian people, it's just like political intentions, right? Um, but just to think about like the importance of like literature in this kind of like landscape, right? It's um, it's terrifying to think about like what we consider fact and truth, like historical truth based on what media and what our governments tell us. And then like to come into, I would say like these minor details, right? The everyday moments that actually change our perspective. Um, 
And one other thing um, that I wanted to um, touch upon was this idea of um, like the two halves. So in reality, like we're just reading like 60 pages for each of them, even less, right? 55 pages. So it's like very short, but um, the necessity of these two next to one another and the fact that one is like so detailed on like the daily life of the soldiers, the officer. And we see like movements, like he cleans up himself. Like he walks around the room, he um, hears a sound or this is the order he gets. So we're very close to him, even though it's not like internal necessarily. And then in the second half, we are removed from that situation. And then there's this woman who's trying to find out what happened on that day. So. And what we realize in the end, it's impossible, right? So the only people who know what happened on that day in that moment would be um, the people who were present there, right? The girl, the Bedouin girl is not there, there to tell her story. The Bedouin people who are killed on that day as well, along with the camels are not even mentioned in the murder scene that we only hear about the camels being killed and then there are other bodies around. Um, so to think about the fact that like she sets out on this quest, but really like, what can she find? She can't really find anything, right? So it's just like part of history is erased, even though there are these attempts to get close to it, right? So it's always a, um, an attempt to arrive at something, but there's always failure associated with it, right? Yeah, absolutely. And I think one thing, Another thing that makes this, this novel really notable to me, I mean, I think of other works um, that are taking sort of anonymous, um, anonymous victims of violence or, or of history or whatever you want to call it, um, and trying to like um, sort of give them back their narratives. Like I'm thinking of something like um, Banu Kapil's uh, Bad and Ban Lea, which is a attempt to sort of recover the story of a, um, uh, murdered uh, woman in, in Britain. Um, Shibley insists that, that that can't be done. It's impossible. We can't reclaim or recover the story of this person. Um, and there's something, but yet her, her story and her history um, continues through both the search and this journey of the narrator in the second part of the novel, um, but also through the very fact of what Palestine is today. Um, and um, again, going back to, to what Pupa was saying earlier about how it's the, what's not said, what's not able to be told, the lacunae left in the story um, that give it so much of its power. Mm -hmm. um, and I was thinking too, um, you know, thinking about how much, um, our understandings of Israel and Palestine are, are sort of shaped by official narratives um, coming from our own countries of origin or elsewhere. Um, I think part of what Shibley is doing with this idea of the minor detail is trying to sort of uncover the story beneath the official story. Um, and I wonder if it might be useful to, um, to look together at um, some of the moments where she um, first brings up this idea of the minor detail, and maybe we can talk about that a bit. Um, and I'm looking on page 58, which is, I can tell you what page that is of the PDF. Um, sorry, hold on a sec. Page 18, 17, okay. 18, yeah. Um, 18, 18 and 19, yeah. Great. So I'm gonna, um, I'm gonna sort of jump around a little bit between uh, from sort of 58 to 61, but we first hear her on 58. Um, she comes across this, this newspaper story about um, this Bedouin woman, woman who had been uh, raped and murdered in, the, in 1949. Um, and um, we have this moment of her 
discovering the coincidence, this is about two thirds of the way down the page, the incident took place on a morning that would coincide exactly a quarter of a century later with the morning of my birth. Of course, this may seem like pure narcissism. The fact that what drew me to the incident, what made it begin haunting me was the presence of a detail that is really quite minor when compared to the incident's major details, which can only be described as tragic. And then um, further on, this is going to page 61. This minor detail, which others might not give a second thought will stay with me forever. In spite of myself and how hard I try to forget it, the truth of it will never stop chasing me. There may in fact be nothing more important than this little detail if one wants to arrive at the complete truth, which by leaving out the girl's story, the article does not reveal. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it's, it's not just talking about the minor detail, it's also the way she's writing it, right? Um, is all attention to minor details, um, both in the first half and in the second half. Um, for example, one thing that kind of like mirrors itself between the two sections is in the first half, we see the officer being obsessed with just like making sure that he's clean, right? So we get like all these minor details about like how he changed his clothes or he uses soap to clean his skin or how he um, draws himself or like hangs the clothes. So it's like very like zoomed in. And in the second half, there's a scene where the building next to the office where the woman works gets um, attacked by the Israeli forces because they believe someone is hiding in the building. So there is like um, an explosion. And what the detail that we see in that scene is just like, the narrator obsessively cleans the dust on her desk, right? So it's like of all the things that have happened around her, it's the dust that makes that moment like so um, weighted, right? Or um, even like thinking about um, the minor detail of, um, I think there is, let me find that other section. Or even um, on her quest, as she's driving around, she mentions like all these different vegetations that she notices, right? So the, the plants around, the names of them become very important. Um, and I want to relate that back to um, something that's, I mean, why that is important is one of the ways that the Israeli forces um, try to take away the Palestinian identity or the Palestinian livelihood is to actually not just take their own lives, but also to um, destroy um, the greenery. Um, and I was, um, I remember that um, some years ago I was um, watching this um, documentary about how the Palestinians have started to um, grow um, cacti on the borders of their land. And even if like they, um, the Israelis like take the land and try to um, destroy the vegetation, the plants always come back. So there is no way of destroying the vegetation, right? So just thinking about like, how can this um, um, struggle continue, not just by human lives, but also like by how the land itself is um, speaking back to the oppressors, right? So just like the minor, and I think like for me, like just her attention to the details of like, what are the plants that she's seeing or what are the trees that she's mentioning brings back this idea of like, it is important what trees we see on this land, what trees exist at the moment or once existed on the land and are not there anymore, right? Yeah, absolutely. And, and because many of these types of plants appear in both the first section and the second section, mm -hmm. they, the plants themselves become a kind of witness, mm -hmm. right? They have persisted through time. Mm -hmm. um, and it's not, and the, the plants, the cleanliness, also there's um, a, a dog is barking throughout the first section. Um, that's actually what tips off the soldiers to the fact that um, this group of Bedouins is in this mm -hmm. um, is in this area, and then we have the second section starting um, 
at the in the second sentence of the of the second section at that moment a dog on the opposite hill began to howl incessantly so we have these um repetitions these connections that not only um make us think about the the story in a different way but as a reader provide this sense of cohesion um if there's um that Charles Baxter essay on rhyming action and on these sort of like subtle ways that writers plant um, repeated actions or details or descriptions or whatever they may be throughout a text in order to create that sense of, um, of cohesion. And I think that's something else that Shibley does so masterfully here. Sometimes you really notice it. Sometimes I think it's kind of like in the back of your consciousness, um, these connections that she creates in that way. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, shall we talk about the maps a bit, Sarah? Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so in the second half of, um, thanks, Allison, for sharing that section. Um, in the second half of the book where um, she sets on this um, journey, um, one thing that is striking is that she takes with her several maps. One is the official Israeli map. One is the Palestinian map. One is um, just like more local maps. So there are all these different maps that she has to um, refer back to while she is driving. And the other thing is she mentions that I haven't been out of my own area for many years. So this is also like, even though she's not going to another country, even though she's not like moving that far away right she takes the whole journey in one day but it, the obstacles and the checkpoints are so many um and she just says like she keeps like driving um looking at the maps but also like mentioning how for example this area doesn't look familiar anymore like there are now like these um settlements or now things are destroyed so there is always like this like um, unfamiliarity with the area around her as she is driving as well. And what, um, as I mentioned earlier, the names on the maps are different, right? Or even the, the way that she thinks about a name or um, the way that the signs on the road mention the names are different, right? And then the fact that she actually like stays in a settlement um, in a, um, sorry, in a, yeah, in a, um, like Jewish, um, settlement, um, for the night before she like goes on to find the actual location of the murder and the rape the next morning. Um, I think it's also horrifying in the sense of like, she's staying in a way with the enemies and the book is like completely like, it's so, um, it's so friendly, right? They give her a room, um, she is fine, but there's always that her, right? And that's actually what makes the her worse in the sense of like, nothing really happens to her until the moment that something happens to her, right? So it's kind of like, again, like it's there, even though it doesn't happen to you on every moment and every, um, in every um, location. Um, but to go back to the maps, um, let me find out. So this is from page 81, which I don't think you have the um, excerpt from, but for example, it says, Next, I pick up the map showing the country until 1948, but I snap it shot as horror rushes over me. Palestinian villages, which on the Israeli map appear to have been swallowed by a yellow sea, appear on this one by the dozen, their names practically leaping off the page. I start the engine back up and set off toward my target. Um, so there are all these moments where she consults the map and she has to navigate between the different maps in order to be able to find her way. And in the end, she doesn't find her way, right? Because it's like she arrives at this location and she, re she realizes this wasn't the location because they moved actually the um, settlement because they decided, oh, we have like better resources here, right? 
Mm-hmm. Absolutely. And I, you know, and, and again, just thinking about um, this sort of persistent horror tension, um, even early, earlier on before she's starting out on her trip, she says, you know, in theory, there's no reason people are from that live in area A, like I do, are allowed to move, go to area C, unless the Israeli military decides there's a state, there's a state of emergency, which it basically always does. So, you know, it's, it's, it's also, um, I think this book also does a, a really wonderful job of um, getting at the absurdity of bureaucracy, but um, really showing how that absurdity has this undertone of horror and of violence um, and of control ultimately. Um, I wanted to ask, um, you know, one thing we haven't discussed, and I don't think we we even really talked about this buffet in our um, preliminary conversations, is in the section that you guys read right at the beginning, very beginning of the book, the soldier gets bitten by something, made a spider or something. Mm-hmm. And part of the sort of mounting tension in this first half of the novel is also the fact that this bite is getting infected. He is nearly incapacitated by pain or vertigo or whatever at times. Um, And um, it creates this interesting sort of like um, clock in a way to the book because you're wondering as a reader, like what's gonna happen? How is this gonna keep mounting up? and, I, and he's so, again, so precise and like cleaning out the wound, doing these things the same way all the time, even, and he never tells anyone, he never tells anyone that he has this, this terrible wound. Um, and I'm curious what, Pupe, what you think, what work you think that that wound is doing in the novel? Yeah, I feel, again, it's that like minor, right? And he gets, not just like obsessed with like cleaning the wound, but also trying to find the spider that caused him this harm, right? Mm -hmm. So it's like like constantly looking around the room, trying to find the spider. Um, And I, I kind of read this as like the spider is like the wound of Holocaust, Mm -hmm. you know, like this earlier historical event is now the wound that is being infected right and there is like this idea of like how to clean that but then there's or like always looking for the source of that um, bite but then because of that bite then he is causing harm to someone else right so it's like this restlessness um and this reminds me of um adam rovner who's a um jewish israeli scholar i had him as a professor in university of denver um and in a class on literature of Israel, modern Israel, um, one thing that he mentioned that has stayed with me is that the way the Israeli mind or the propaganda has worked is that anything we do that is less than Holocaust is not really a crime. Hmm. So just like to think about that, like for like thinking that's like, all the different types of violence that is being um, inflicted upon the Palestinians because it's not Holocaust, it's not really a crime, right? Or it's just like getting back what was taken from us. Um, And in this book, in minor detail, I just kept thinking about that, right? Because the officer is so like, there's again, like that feeling of bureaucracy about like what happens, right? How to arrest the girl and bring her back or how to um, how to just keep her away from the soldiers but at the same time he himself goes or stays with him or brings her into her own into his own room, which we initially think it's actually to keep her safe from the soldiers, but there are other intentions involved, right? Um, so I could just keep about, keep thinking about the spider as like this like larger historical um detail right um that is so present in the room that bites him but also like he can never find him Mm -hmm. i wonder how you read it um i really like your reading of it um to me it also just like thinking on the level of characterization it's so much about um control and his desire for control and his mm-hmm. um, 
inability to even like exist in the corporeal realm. He has to, in a way, insist that this hasn't happened, even as its effects continue to overtake him. Um, and, um, you know, so sort of almost, maybe in a way, almost like flipping um, what you've described that this, the, the horror, the wound of the occupation, continuing to eat away at the occupiers as well as the occupied, mm -hmm. um, even if there's this attempt to control it or ignore it. Mm -hmm. um, um, yeah, I think it's, 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 um, it's a powerful device and, um, and one that, one that never sort of breaches, you know, as a reader, you're like, are the other people going to find out? Is he going to die? Is what's going to happen? And it just, it just persists. Right. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's part of what makes it really powerful. But yeah, exactly. Like we, we never really find out what happens to his leg, but we also, can be sure that it's like infected beyond hope at this point right mm -hmm. um so yeah even like even though like he ignores it and tries to pretend that nothing has happened to him it's yeah. there it's so present yeah. yeah yeah um i wonder if this would i um ocean and jason have added some super interesting comments about the spider in the chat and i wonder if this is a good a good time to open things up. Do we, um, do we want to read that other bit or, or do you think we should just transition? Uh, we can, we can just transition. I think we only yeah. have five minutes to 10. So yeah. Okay. Cool. Yeah. So, so if, Ocean, yeah, go yeah. ahead. If anyone has questions or if there are things that came up to your mind that you want to share, uh, we just want to hear from everyone now. Mm -hmm. Jay. Um, I will just state the, um, what is maybe the obvious, but just that Shively is so amazing at sensory detailing mm -hmm. and the care that she takes in, you know, engaging all of the senses, a lot of smell in this book. Um, which is often the sense that is, is, you know, is avoided in the first pass, but um, yeah, just really beautiful, serious attention to detailing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, totally, totally. There's a, um, I'm gonna put, sorry, does someone, does someone else have something? Russell has a hand up. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. Cool. Oh, we don't hear you, Russell. Do you wanna unmute yourself? I think, I think he's trying to hear oh, his audio. Yeah. Is Russell, uh... we can't hear um, you, Russell. I think all of you muted yourself <laughs> at the same time. Yeah, I, some super interesting comments in the chat. Um, Sarah Rushford talking about. We'll try now. Okay. Okay. Can you go hear ahead. me now? Yeah. Now we can hear you. Russ. That's a negator. And nobody reads lips here, I assume. So let's try. <laughs> it's an this. intense mask. Uh, yeah. So go to the camera. Russell, you can just look at your. Yeah, you can sure. look forward. 
Okay, Russell's going to come to the speaking station. The speaking station. So, and since nobody can read lips here, I assume, uh, you know, it's kind of tricky. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, so there are no minor details. Mm -hmm. Life does not have minor details. They're all important, no matter how small. The, the fly shit on the painting is critical. It's important, as is the mm -hmm. sand, how the water is absorbed instantly, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, this is just an opinion, of course. This is how I'm seeing it. And, and the author is, is the way she continues to go into all the details, the minor details. She continues to build on minor details, which accumulates in all of them being very, very important and not minor. They are critical to the story. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. And I think that like one of the things that this book illuminates is that that opinion, Russell, is in fact a somewhat radical um, opinion to have because in a way, um, you know, this the state presents a narrative that decides which details are major and minor. Mm -hmm. So to insist on the importance of a detail officially designated minor is in fact to sort of push back against that official narrative to some extent. Yeah. And one thing we see in the second half is when she um, goes actually to one of the archives um, and the museum um, curator gives her like the history of the settlement and then she is given a handout and she leaves and she realizes that what he told her is actually what has just been printed in the handout. And there is no nuance. So the oral history is really the official history that he's giving her, right? And then she says like, oh, so I could have just like looked at this through their website and didn't even come here, right? And didn't need to come here. So to think about like the minor details that again are totally lost, no matter like what or how many archives and museums are made, right? Or just the necessity of rethinking what even a museum and archive needs to be, right? Um, in the sense of like anything written that she finds is, is not really gonna do it, right? And the oral history is not even there. I think she mentions like actually in the second half, like I should have talked to, for example, this woman, she might have known something that would actually illuminate um, the crime or like the history. Um, and there is nothing in the written archives that is going to help her out. Um, to think about like minor and um, major, um, I'm just gonna read the section from page 90 that um, Sarah and I looked at earlier together. Um, so she says, and although I find no details, neither mi major nor minor, to denounce the crime that occurred here 25 years to the day before I was born, I keep walking through the park. Later, as the sun nears the roofs of houses in Rafah, I walk across the grounds, then the road, get in the car and leave. But we realize later that she doesn't really leave. She decides to stay. Um, yeah. Other thoughts? Yes, Linda, yeah. Just one person decides to create it, but also it's, again, that museum is like um, repeating the official narrative, right? It's not really the correct narrative. Mm -hmm. so, I think that's a, I think, Ocean, I think that's a, that's a really interesting question. Um, how does her telling convey the story differently than a recounting of the major or horrifying details would. Um, mm -hmm. And I keep, that makes me think about, um, let me see if I got this right. This is a quote from an interview that Shibley did in Baum. Um, when she's making this distinction between my literature is not about Palestine and is rather within and from Palestine and um, And so that there's a way, um, like the, the scope becomes more human or something. Um, I think also by focusing on the minor detail, um, it becomes um, 
something that an individual human can grasp, which actually um, augments the horror in a, in a certain way. And to think about the major details, the horrifying details are the ones that find their way to the news, right? And we are hearing them constantly or at least on and off, right? But has, they, has there even be like any real uproar because of the fact that we are receiving these like horrifying like major details, right? Um, so it seems like what happens with the major details, it's like, at some point we also become just like um, accustomed to them, right? It's like, even for her, right? For the narrator of the second half, she says like, oh, the rape and the murder, they happen every day here. So what brings her to focus on this particular one is just like the coincidence of their dates, right? So even for someone within that community, one becomes like um, used to that kind of violence, right? Um, and I, um, thinking about like minor details from like the point of like the language that she uses, um, in one of her, uh, her translator, um, in one of her conversations, she talked about how, for example, in one sentence, when she sent the draft to, uh, Shibley, um, she had, for example, the choice of they dragged her, the Bedouin girl that they had arrested, the officers. Um, they dragged her off the truck. And then Shibley wrote back and said like, no, no dragging. They just took her out of the truck. So thinking about the choices made on the level of language, she was saying like dragging already has violence in it. The language itself shouldn't have any violence. It should be just like completely like normal on the line, you know? And then the violence is already there. So the language doesn't need to do the work of like um, amplifying the violence. So um, um, Elizabeth Jacqueline was talking about how like I realized like how I needed to stay very close to the choices that she was making and not bring in my own like concerns with like this violent content into the English language, right? So just like keep it very like, um, kind of silent and quiet, right? Uh, and the violence, again, is just what exists in between um, the lines and um, around the words uh, on the page. That really reminds me um, of uh, the, the Russian theorist Viktor Shklovsky's discussion of um, defamiliarization in his essay, Artist Technique, where you know we talk about defamiliarization comes up in these conversations and I think fairly frequently in the in the MFA discussions, and often we're talking about this idea of defamiliarization being used to make um, the familiar strange, but it's also to make the strange familiar. And if we think of strange as any kind of augmented um, augmented description or reality, he has this example of a scene from um, Tolstoy, I believe, where instead of saying, you know, they um, they whipped this person. He says, they took a long stick and they lifted it in the air and they raised it and they used it to hit his back. And similarly, I think using took instead of drag, when you really just like unadorn the mm -hmm. language, you can really see it, right? Like dragged elides something there. Like it's violent language, but it we're used to, you know, horribly, we're used to what it might mean for someone to be dragged, but took like, that's really bare. Like mm -hmm. that lays it out, you know? Um, and I think that's super powerful. Yeah, totally, totally. Um, a few minutes left. Um, if anyone has final thoughts or questions or, um, you know, other texts that this reminds you of. Yeah, the landscape has agency. Mm -hmm. 
One other element that's both like the two sections are kind of playing with is the idea of like identity, right? There's like the Bedouin girl's identity and then the narrator in the second part becomes kind of like a ghost of that identity until she actually becomes that identity, right? Um, but also to think about the fact that like for her in order to even go on this journey, she has to just like um, borrow someone else's identity to be able to go from area A to area C. Um, and when she wants to stay overnight, she just says like, I'm here because I'm a scholar and I want to research about the history of the area. So she's again, like hiding who she really is and why she is really there. Um, And one thing I was, um, in one of the reviews of the book, I wanna read this because it's just like thinking about like minor details. So um, the Negev gang rape actually like is a true story. So in a way Shibley is like trying to reimagine right without even like but there's again like that failure to completely like arrive at that true story but the um this review in the guardian mentioned um according to declassified documents the real life commander answered his superior's question on whether the girl was eventually returned to her village by reporting that his soldiers killed her because quote it was a shame to waste the petrol. Um, I'll put that quote in the um, yeah. Um, and that's the kind of like horror that Shibley really gets to in the book, right? It's those moments of decision that seem very impulsive. Um, yeah, her life was not even worth, I mean, that's just an excuse, but just to think that like, that sounds like a logical excuse, you know, like it wasn't, why should we? Um, mm -hmm. I mean, and in a way, like, and this sort of just, like, it, I think speaks to the, everything we've been talking about. It almost feels, it feels surprising that this story is known at all, <laughs> you know? Like, even for how incomplete it is and how little we know, the fact that, that we even know the story exists is in itself an anomaly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Jason, yeah. The entire book is a minor detail in the scope of the occupation, but these many details comprise the real truth of the situation. Yeah. Mm -hmm. When you, um, like one thing that comes up like in um, like human rights um, courts of law and in um, like memory studies um, texts is like how it's actually the minor details that make the difference, right? Um, for, for you to be able to actually bring something to a court of law or to give like more of a holistic picture. I mean, this is something that is true also about the apartheid era in South Africa. They talk about like how uh, for the courts, what was important was um, not just to read about the specific events, but to read um, like witness accounts of like the everyday lives of the people, right? So like the surrounding narrative is as important as like the central event that they were looking at because it was only with those details that they could get like a more holistic picture, right? Um, and be able to argue for the cases. Um, yeah, so, and I, I would say probably like that's the danger, right? In the fact that we are always pushed towards the major details, right? Minor details don't matter. Like why, why should anyone care? Um, but at the same time, it's the minor details that keep things alive. Lydia, that's such a good point. Maybe that's why actually Shibley made that choice, right? To use the gas in that scene. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, and that's the smell of gasoline is one of those those persistent sense, sense mm-hmm. sensory details that persist throughout both yeah. both sections. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, well, thank you, everybody. Um, this book is just like, there's so much we could continue to talk about. It's such an endlessly rich text and um, it's great to hear all of your thoughts and great to great to get to talk about it with you, Pouvet. Yeah, same here, Sarah. Um, I hope those of you who didn't get the chance to read it before this talk um, are now more inclined to read it. It really is like a work to stay with. Um, and you can't really read the whole thing in one reading. I mean, I was not able, I had to pause like after every few pages, like it's like so, uh, so heavy, even though the hers are not out there, right? Mm-hmm. Sarah and Poupe, thank you so much. Let's give them a hand. Wonderful conversation. And thank you all for your comments in the chat and your attention. It is 1012. So we will um, join the new Zoom link that should be on your Google calendar at 1030 and we will have an all community meeting. Uh, I do wanna give the faculty um, a little heads up that you all can attend the first half of it. The second half might not be as important. So, um, cause we're just going over um, some, our new learning management system. Um, okay, I'll see you all at 1030. Thanks everyone, see you. Thanks, Thanks everyone.